because our hearts have become hardened and our ears have become deaf and we're offended. Verse 18, another translation says, the minds are, their, mind, their minds are in the dark and they are stubborn and ignorant and have missed out on the life that comes from God. They no longer have any feeling about what is right. We are coming into a time where people are no longer feeling about what is right. The Bible says in the last days, the hearts of men will wax cold. And it says their hearts will fail them. Because of the time. But we are to have the mind of Christ. You see how far we stray? We are to have the mind of Christ. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Prayerfully, you guys are with me. I'm not moving too quick on this. But this is weighty. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Says this. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. I'm going to read through verse 16. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know what the things that have been freely given to us by God. We've received the spirit not of the world, but the spirit of God, that we might know, that we might know the things that are freely given to us. I mean, the Holy Spirit is in my life that I might know, that I might be enlightened, that I might have revelation, that I might know the things that are freely given and transmitted to me from God. Watch this. He says, um, these things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Now hear me. The reason that the enemy wants to hearten the heart of the believer, the follower of Christ, is because he needs you to lose your ability to discern. Because carnally, you cannot discern spiritual things. So if I get you to operate in the realm of your flesh, I can limit your ability to discern. Because spiritual things have to be compared to spiritual things. And if I keep, if I can render you spiritualist, <laughs> if, I can lend, if I can render you without the ability to, to discern spiritual things and keep you operating in your carnal flesh and your carnal mind, now you're no different from those that are lost. So whatever God is trying to reveal, you're going to miss it anyway. It can't be manifested in the earth because you have no discernment. Because you're conscious, now you've been seared. Your ears are now dull. Your heart is now thick. You can no longer hear. Watch this. The fleshy heart that we once received has now become hardened again. Now you're confused because your spirit is saying something ain't right. But your heart is so hard you can't hear the clarity that comes from God. So are you at that point, if anybody ever experienced that, you know something on the inside of you, but you can't quite make out what's being said. And it's not that God's not talking. It's that we become distant to his voice. Okay, listen, y'all remember, what did Satan do? We taught this. What was his step in the garden? What's the first thing he did when he showed up in the garden? He positioned himself between the voice of God and man. The voice of God came walking in the cool of the day. Satan comes and says, hath God said? He pins man against the voice of God. But watch this. He gets Adam and Eve, and he gets Eve who turns and gives it to Adam, but he gets them to hearten their heart to the voice of God by getting them to look at what they were told they should not eat. Here it is again, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. What does it do? It causes you to stray. And separate from the very voice of God. And now because there's distance between the voice of God and man, he can now execute what his plan and his agenda is. To bring death in the earth. And Satan once again has now come on the scene to the church. And he's used COVID-19. He's used 
racism and systematic oppression. He's used whatever he could use and whatever he's planted to perpetuate in the hearts of men and in the church. And once again, now we're struggling to hear the voice of God. Now you're positioned in between your emotions, your feelings, your anger, or what God said. I don't know how to respond. I feel this way. Watch this. But now I'm losing sight of what the word said concerning it. Or now when it comes to the word, I'm interpreting the word based upon my feelings. When Jesus simply said, if you don't take up your cross and follow after me, you cannot be my disciple. You know what I'm saying? Unless you can crucify yourself, you cannot follow me. You can't learn of me. <laughs> we are at a time where God is drawing a line in the sand. No matter, we draw one. And either you can hear me, walk with me, or don't. But there's no more gray. Because there's a dying world that depends on those who can hear the voice of God. That have died to themselves. That there's nothing else that Satan can use to manipulate. Remember when, when, when Jesus said the evil one's coming, but he has nothing in me? God said, if y'all won't dry it up, I will. <laughs> I'll bring you to a point where there's nothing left. And now you got to make a decision. It's a heart issue. Watch this. It goes on to say this. But he who is spiritual judges all things, verse 15. Yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For he who, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him. But we have what? The mind of Christ. Now let me say something really quick about this. And, and we'll transition um, to, to moving into a close. So we, we, we're supposed to have the mind of Christ. Do you know the purpose that we've come to church and that we're supposed to come to church is to gain the mind of Christ? He gave, the, he gave those apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher events for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ until we all come into the unity of faith, the full measure and stature of him, him, Jesus, that we may all grow up into who? Him, Jesus, who is the head of of all things. You're supposed to be growing up into the head of Christ. Meaning, I used to joke, we used to talk about this like neck down, meaning when you come to God, you are neck down. He doesn't want your head. Your head is infected. Okay. The knowledge, the tree of knowledge, good and evil. You know where our issues lie? Here. That's why Christ said, no, you can't be the head. I'll be the head. You just be the body. I need you to take on my thoughts. I need you to take on my mind. I need you to have my perspective because there are things that are coming that will challenge and test you. And if you don't think like I think, you're going to fail. If you don't think like I think, you're going to drift away. If you don't think like I think, you're going to succumb to what's happening in your life. You have to learn to think like me. So I'm going to send fivefold to perfect, to mature you so you grow up here. Okay. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your Right. So, I love reading books from Dr. Caroline Leaf, and uh, in one of her books, she talks about the power of thought, a thought life. Uh, it's the science of thought theory that she and one of her colleagues they had uh, stated. Uh, they had talked about three levels of thought. Now, it's important that you understand this because the enemy understands this. There are three levels of thought. One is the non-conscious metacognitive level. This is one, uh, this is on the far left of the brain, and it is where 90 to 99% of the action in your mind is. So let's say 90% of the action of your mind is in the non-conscious metacognitive level or the left side. Your thinking and your thought building habit happens on this level. This level operates out of about 400 billion actions per second. And drives the conscious cognitive level. It operates 24 hours a day. That means when you're sleeping, this part of your brain is still working. 
Systemic issues, you know what they really lie? They don't lie in a system. They lie in a system, all right. A system here. That's where it lies. This is the high place that Satan is after. This is where he works. This is where Paul says, cast down every thought and imagination that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. If this don't change, nothing else changes. If this don't change, you won't walk in the freedom that you do have. If this don't change, you'll continue to mentally enslave people. If this don't change, you'll continue to enslave and oppress people and hold them in systems that they should not be in. This is the part of man that works 24 hours a day. This level, watch this. So then the second level is the conscious cognitive level. This is the middle and is, this is in the middle and it is where up to 10% of the mind's action is. It operates at about 2,000 actions per second. Now the other one is it operates at about 400 billion actions per second, but the cognitive part at it, it operates at about uh, 2,000 actions per second. So it's much slower and is controlled by the metacognitive level. So the conscious part is slower than the unconscious part. The conscious part is actually controlled by the unconscious part. Are y'all with me? Stay with me on this. The cognitive level in turn drives the symbolic level, which is what you say and do. And what the world sees, the outputting of your thinking. This level operates when you are awake. <laughs> it's funny. I find it funny about the stay woke. If you don't change the subconscious part of you, you ain't woke. <laughs> if you don't change what's working in your mind, even when you're not thinking about it, you're not woke. Because it's what's going on in your thought that you're not giving thought to. That's the problem. It's the part that keeps you from the mind of Christ. When you get this, you'll understand why David said, I meditate on your word day and night. When you get this, you'll understand why God told Joshua, meditate on my word day and night. Let it not depart from you. Don't turn to the left or the right. I need you to meditate. Why? Because God is saying, I need you to get this in your metacognitive level. I need to get this in the part of your mind that while you're sleeping, you can keep your mind stayed on me. <laughs> he will keep you in perfect peace. Whose mind, what? Not just while you are awake. When you get this, you'll understand the importance of protecting your mind, or as the Bible put it, guards your heart. You be very careful when you, what you put in. See, Satan has been setting up a plan for us for a long time. He's been working and, and, and perpetuating unconscious thoughts. He's been working through, watch this, through media, through television, through entertainment, and he's been building up something that if you're not sensitive to God, the unconscious part of you will control you. That's why some people slip and say stuff that they say, oops, I did not mean to say that. Because it was working in their subconscious mind. Right now, the church is divided because people have let stuff slip out of their mouth that they didn't deal with that was festering in their heart. And they thought, just if I don't say nothing, it'll go away. But no, you didn't deal with it. You didn't cast it down. So now we got division in the church because of stuff people said. And you said, no, 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 that's what you meant because you said it. But can I, can, I, can I say something to you? It's not necessarily that's what they meant. That's just what they were rehearsing. That's what they were giving thought to. And when they, and they failed to think about what they were thinking about. <laughs> See, it's funny. You won't give people a pass. But then when actions come out of you that are contrary to God, you're saying, God, I don't know where that came from. God, please forgive me. That wasn't my intention. God says, yeah, but you didn't deal what you were thinking about. You didn't deal with what was going on through your mind. Just, you thought you was cool because you didn't say nothing. But Satan, he didn't need you to say nothing yet. He just needs you to, he just needed to perpetuate. He just needed to keep working in your thoughts and in your mind and in the process because eventually he's going to do something where it's going to come out. And now you're going to find yourself driven by subconscious thought and not cognitive thought. This is what I'm trying to say. Now you're doing things that don't make sense. Or now you're doing things that had you thought about it, you wouldn't have done it. You ever done that? You ever done something that you said, man, I wish I would have never done it, but you did it in the heat of your spirit? It's because it was already working in your heart. You just never dealt with it. 
So that's the conscious cognitive level. And then there's what we call the symbolic action level. The symbolic output level incorporates the five senses through which we express ourselves and, and experience the world. It's serving as the contact between the external world and the internal world, or should I say the world of the mind. Therefore, this model works in reverse as well as forming a perfect circle. So information comes through the five senses, is received consciously, but the conscious cognitive level and then passes into the non-conscious cognitive level where if you have paid attention and started thinking and choosing, it becomes a physical thought as a result of genetic expression, making of proteins of matter, because that's how your brain works. In other words, you thought about it long enough that it came into an actual action. Now watch this. This works in a perfect circle. So your life is controlled by the things that you subconsciously think about. But then what happens is the symbolic level of your five senses, an event or something triggers, and if, you don't, if you're not careful and you don't govern what you're thinking about concerning that, you will form certain perspectives or strongholds or thoughts concerning it. And then you will let it perpetuate in your mind. So Satan has been playing this very skillfully. And what he's done is now he's getting us to a point where we're so stray and so far away from the voice of God, just like I do with Prince. He's calling our name, but we're having difficulty hearing him or we're putting him on mute because of how we feel. This morning I took my dog out and, and now he knows there's a bush that I've got on him time and time about. So now when the door opens, I walk around the corner, and he's sitting there looking towards the door, but he's not messing with the bush. And he will sit there and look at me. I call his name, he won't come. I instantly know you were messing with the bush and you were doing what you were supposed to do, but he's not responding to my voice. But thank God we have a shepherd that is willing to come even if he has to <laughs> Break the leg of the sheep that keeps running away and put it on its shoulders that he'll shepherd us back into his care. And I think we're at a place where God is just breaking the legs of the sheep. Because we keep allowing ourselves to stray. But he loves us enough that he'll put us on his shoulders and carry us back into his presence. He realizes that in this system I told you about, Satan understands it too. And he uses it. It's called, uh, watch this. So, you know, how, how do we get the mind of Christ to, to, to operate in our life? Well, there's a process called automization. It's a life principle. Automization is, uh, it's after a period of repeated thinking about a choice over, uh, uh, over about 21 days, a new thought moves into the non-conscious metacognitive level. Right. And where it becomes part of the internal perception. This process is called automization. It's simply uh, an example of automization is learning how to ride a bike. Right. Uh, you know, initially it's difficult. It was difficult. You wobbled around. But as you practice with determination, intensity, concentration over a sequence of, you know, going through, going through, eventually you know how to ride a bike. Now, notice when you got on a bike, unless you've been off it for a while, you don't really think about it. You just get on and start paddling and you got the balance and you're, you're going about your business. But how did you get to the point where you're watch this, where you automatically did that? It was through a period of doing the same thing or thinking about the same thing over and over and over again until it becomes not second nature, but actually a part of your nature. So Satan realizes that in order for you to have the nature of Christ and all the things that Second Peter said that he gave to you come out of you, you're going to have to meditate, think about it, get it in you, and then it becomes not second nature, but a part of your nature. So now the person of Christ actually comes out of you, and, and no matter what's happening in your life, automatically, you don't have to think about it, you don't have to pray about it, it just comes out of you. Satan says, but wait a minute, but if I can hearten the heart of the unbeliever and then use the same system that God created to create a reverse effect. This is why his actions are called perversions, because perverse means to make crooked what was once straight. He doesn't create new systems. He used existing systems. So he took God's process and said, I'll contaminate it with what you're hearing, what you're seeing. I'll use fear to perpetuate it and get you thinking that way over and over and over again. So now you're no longer acting in faith. You're acting out of fear. See, he knows that when it came to salvation, Romans 10 says that. Uh, let's look at this. We'll close this. Go to Romans 10 really quick. Have you noticed this is how we started and this is how we have to finish? Satan understands alone here. Romans 10.
verse 8. <laughs> Romans 10, verse 8 says, But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your where? Heart. That is the word of what faith that we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe where? In your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be what? Saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, wait a minute. How important is the mouth, the heart, and the mouth? The heart and the mouth actually leads you into the experience of salvation. So we confess with our mouth that we believed in our heart, and it leads us into the manifestation of salvation. Now, in Romans 1, verse 17, it says, the just shall live by what? Faith. Now, if you jump to verse 13 in the same text, it says, For whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall the preacher preach unless he is sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad, uh, who, who bring, uh, glad tidings of good things. The writer continues to talk, and his overarching point is that the just shall live by faith. So notice, the preacher sent by God at his mouthpiece preaches the gospel of peace. Where? To the heart. Why? Because this is where it all starts, and that's where faith begins. And, visualize, and, and watch this, and the visualization of kingdom realities. It starts where? In the heart. When you meditate. Where does it come from? The heart. Or you're trying to get it, rather, in your heart. Jesus says, what defiles a man? It's not what comes, it's what comes out of the, what comes out of the mouth, it comes out of the what? The abundance of the heart. Satan understands, I have to get to the heart, because that's where they start. That's where their faith was conceived. That's where God constantly works. That's what God gave them was a new heart. So if confession and salvation and the visualization of the kingdom started with the heart, I have to contaminate the heart. I have to, uh, it's the reason that we are to guard our heart with all what? Diligence. For out of it flows the, the going forth of life. Because he understands that hearing comes by, I mean, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the what? Word of God. Faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by the what? Word of God. So this is the point. I have to, if faith comes by hearing, I have to distance or put myself in between what they're able to hear, especially in times like this. Because if you notice, as I said before, where are all the faith messages right now? Where is divine healing right now? You know where? Satan has positioned himself between the voice of God. It's all of a sudden like God stopped talking about healing because of COVID. Like God stopped talking about the miraculous, the supernatural. Have you noticed that? It ain't that God stopped talking. You know what happened? Fear got in between the voice of God and the people of God. And now because we're seeing and hearing fear, it's perpetuating in our life. And there's a greater gap greater distance because he understands faith coming by hearing. Now, let me say this. By faith, we understand faith is born of the spirit in the hearts of mankind. Write that down. Faith is born of the spirit in the hearts of mankind. Faith is neither intellectual nor anti-intellectual. It's just superior to intellect. Notice the Bible does not say, with the mind man believes. The mind has to be transformed. The only thing God gave new was a heart. So watch this. Through faith, man is able to come into agreement with the mind of God. I'm going to say it again. Through faith, Man is able to come into agreement with the mind of God. Hence the reason Satan is trying to rob us of faith right now. Because it's through faith you come into agreement with the mind of God. See, when we submit the things of God to the mind of man, unbelief and religion are the result. But when we submit the mind of man to the things of God, we end up with faith and a renewed mind. 
Much of the opposition to the revival we long for in the midst of COVID comes from the soul-driven Christian. In other words, we're trying to submit the things of God to the mind of man instead of submitting the mind of man to the things of God. <laughs> Paul calls it carnal. It's where we fail to be led by the Spirit of God. And anything that doesn't make sense to the rational mind is automatically in conflict with Scripture. Listen, we all have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us if we're born again. This is the place of communion with God. We talked about it last week. David said, this one thing do I seek, right? That I may dwell in the house of the Lord. That's this, I'm going out that I may dwell. And I said at that time, because the house of the Lord was the only place where the presence of God dwell. But now through the precious gift that Christ has given us and the Father has given through the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, now we have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us and we have access to his voice and to relationship and to grow in that. We can commune with him. When we learn from the Spirit, our mind becomes student and, and, and we become subject to the Holy Spirit. By faith, we understand. Watch this. So faith is now the foundation of our spiritual growth. And because our hearts remain sensitive and we have the Holy Spirit in our life, we can begin to grow spiritually and continue to grow spiritually. You know, we have to learn to learn the way. Uh, and, and then, I'm sorry, let me say it this way. Um, we have to get to a place where um, <laughs> we open ourselves up to grow in true faith. Because faith does not require understanding to function. Write this down. If you don't get anything in this particular season, the just shall live by faith, and faith does not require the understanding to function. You know what it requires? Trust. Some of us right now, you're trying to get understanding, and God may give us glimpses. We all hear and see through a glass darkly. But at the end of the day, remember the three Hebrew boys? They said, no matter what y'all do, we're not going to bow down. God is well and able to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, yet will we what? I may not understand why we got to get thrown in the fire. I don't understand what's going on, but faith doesn't require understanding. Faith requires trust. And so Satan is trying right now in this season to rob us of the ability to hear the proceeding word of God. I told you Romans 10 and 17 says, faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Jesus said to Lucifer, to Satan in Matthew 4 and 4, when he says, hey, look, turn this stone into bread. Jesus says something very powerful. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that what? Pro that what? Proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that what? Proceed is out of mouth God. The more you can hear God's voice, the more your faith will increase, the more opportunities for you to trust and to grow in that particular area. And Satan knows that in this hour, if we're ever going to arise and shine, faith has to be intact. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that I hearten the hearts of man and try to deafen the ears of man because when their hearts are hardened and their ears are deaf, they're no longer sensitive to the voice of God. And when they're not sensitive to the voice of God, they can't enter into the rest of God. So I'm going to rob them of the ability to hear the proceeding word of God because that's where we are to live by or what we are to live by. That's our daily bread. This is what we are to live by. And watch this. No ability to hear means that we're not fed. Therefore, no life. Now it brings it to this thought. Jesus said in John 10, my sheep hear my voice. They know it. And a stranger, they will not what? I want to close reading Psalms 23. Prayerfully, this message is 
struck your heart and you hear where we're coming from, where, what I'm trying to articulate and share. Satan understands that he that dwelleth in the secret place abides under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, remember the word Almighty means violent avenger. He understands the Lord is our light and our salvation. He's our strength, our shield, our buckler. He's our strong tower. The righteous run in and they are safe. I can't get you while you're covered. But if I can get you to stray from your covering. So how do I do it? Because the truth is you have no power in and of yourself. The only thing you have, the only thing you have is your covering. I understand that his sheep hear his voice and a stranger they will not follow. But if I can get you to heart in your heart, you'll become like the children of Israel in the wilderness when God was trying to lead them from Egypt into Canaan. And God says... You tried me these 10 times because you heard my voice and instead your heart became hardened and the hardened heart becomes an evil heart of unbelief. And the Lord says in that text, he says, I swore in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. And I'm like, God, what rest? And all the scholars and we're talking and the Lord said to me, go to Psalms 23. You want to know what rest I'm talking about? The Lord is my shepherd. He's my protector. He's my pastor. He finds pasture is what shepherd means. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, word want translates, I shall not lack anything. Watch this. Y'all ready for the rest? He makes me to lie down in green pastures. The word lie down means to rest. He makes me to rest. Now this is David writing and we know David had a tumultuous life. I mean, he was running from Saul and hiding in caves and he was on the run for a large portion of his life. I mean, from the time that he was anointed to the time he became king, they said it was anywhere between 15 to 17 years. The Lord is my shepherd. He, I shall not want. He makes me to, to rest in green pastures. Green pastures means the plush the place you'll build your homestead. He makes me to rest in green pastures. The Lord told me this, guys. He said, I want you to understand something, Tyrone. I determined the pasture and I set the table. I said, huh? He said, keep reading. He leads me by steel waters, by waters that bring refreshing. He restores my soul, revives it. There's nothing like a revived, refreshed child of God. Watch this. He leads me in the path of righteousness. He doesn't just tell me to go. He leads me for his namesake. So it goes, the writer David's talking about God's provision, and then notice the shift. Now he's going to move into the protection. Because in the midst of all of this, he says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of what? I will what? Fear no evil. For you are your rod and your staff. The rod was used to beat off attackers. The staff was used to correct me in my way. They both comfort me. I, was, I once told someone, I said, man, if you ever caught yourself walking through the valley of the shadow of death, you should not fear, but rather be excited. Because the only way to have a shadow 
is to have a light that cast it. Never be intimidated by the shadow because the shadow always appears bigger than the object that sits in between the light and the shadow. You know, the Bible says that we're going to have a chance to see Satan and say, is this the one that caused so much havoc in the earth? And right now, the shadow of death, we've allowed it to overshadow the light that comes from my father. David said, I ain't going to fear any evil. Why? Because you're with me. Verse five, you prepare a table before me, in the presence of my enemies. Where? Right in the midst of them. What if I told you that God was looking to prepare your table right in the midst of COVID-19? But we're so far from faith. We're so far from his voice. We think God has to get us through it before he sets the table. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Huh. You appointed me for this, and I'm overjoyed by it. And just in case, I don't have to worry about what's coming behind because goodness and mercy shall follow me <laughs> all the days of my life. There it is again. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. How long, David? Forever. Listen, what I want you to do is I need you to take this word, go back, look at it, research it, study it. But I need you to think about something. Actually, no. I need you to get before God. And I need you to say of the Lord that he is your shepherd. For the next 21 days, I want you to get that in your subconscious mind. That the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I want you to get it into your mind. I want you to get it into your mind until your heart begins to become sensitive again to the voice of God. God will never leave you nor forsake you. That was his promise. Remember I told you guys, it's not that the Lord is distant. It's that the Lord is distinct. And whenever we're thinking opposite of him, he feels far away. But how can an omnipresent God be far away? It's only when our minds are different and our hearts are different that he's distant. Guard your heart. Be careful of the slight of the hand of the enemy. If whatever emotion you're feeling is taking you away from the word of God, think about what you're thinking about and check it. God does not move or operate or reveal himself through our emotions. Want to know why? Because they're too unstable. It makes us schizophrenic. It makes us bipolar. You're good when you feel good. God must be pleasant with you, must be happy. When you feel bad, God must have left you and forsaken you. It's not the truth. And I told you, your feelings are never necessarily a reflection of truth. But what you can do is you can think better and cause yourself to feel better. Because usually when you're thinking bad, it's because you let yourself, you operated off of your feeling bad. Or rather, you were thinking bad and it caused you to feel bad. So church, I challenge you. Guard your heart. If you notice your heart starting to become hardened, 
for the next 21 days saturated with the word of God. Psalms 23. Because the truth is, God's got you covered. Even with my old wretched mind, God said, don't worry about it. I got a new mind for you. I got you covered. If you're here, I want you to stand to your feet. Hello, my name is Minister Yolanda Comas, and we're so happy you joined us today. We hope that something was said that has compelled you to want to follow this God we serve. The Word of God said that He loved us so much that He wants and He has provided a remedy for us to come to Him. All we have to do is acknowledge that we have sinned. We have to believe that the remedy He provided is Jesus Christ. And we have to confess that He is Lord and Savior of our life. So repeat after me. Father God, I acknowledge that I have sinned. Father, I accept the remedy that you have provided for me in Jesus Christ dying and rising again from the dead on my behalf. And Father, I confess that he is Lord of my life. If you have done that, you have made the best decision of your life and we're celebrating with you. We ask that you would go to our church app, click on the I've Decided link and fill out the information. Someone will contact you from our church ministry and they will let you know the next steps. Also, if you want prayer, please fill out the information at that same location. If you wanna join Kingdom Life and become part of this awesome ministry, we would love to have you. We thank you for joining us today. We love you and we will see you next week. Hey family, hopefully you enjoyed the word today. Um, listen, don't, our God is our shepherd. That should mean so much more to you right now. The Lord is my shepherd. He's the owner, the author, the finisher of all things, and he is our protector, our shepherd. All right, so I'll perfectly have blessed your heart. Now listen to me. What I want you to do is I want you to go back. I want you to start with the, I think the teaching on sound and sober when we started having to make this transition to online only. Uh, it was in our Christ, our Redeemer series, I believe when it started. I need you to go back, make sure you're listening to those things. God was preparing us mentally for the challenges to come in these upcoming uh, days, all right, in this next season. Listen, church, we have to become dwellers, right? We gotta be sound and sober in our mind. We gotta remain in the presence of God because he will keep us through all of this, all right? Now, I want you to do that. Now, the other thing I'm gonna put out here is I'm looking, this has just really been pressed upon my heart here, um, to uh, yesterday and this morning is that we're going to be making a call. I need at least 70 people, right? I need at least 70 people. That means 10 people a day from Monday through Sunday that is willing to come in our space, right? To our campus and pray for one hour a day. You should have received an email concerning this. I need you to respond to that email and, and let us know you're willing to participate in an in-person, all right, one hour, we're only gonna take 10 people for seven days uh, and we're gonna bombard heaven. We have to move into a place of intercession. Remember the Bible says that God sought for a person to make up the hedge and he found none and he was looking for someone to stand in between so he would not destroy the city. Listen, we are in a trying time. I believe that God is executing some things, really trying to get the attention of the world to see repentance and to uh, open an opportunity for revival. But the church has got to step in. Why? Because the enemy is really pulling a sleight of hand. Uh, he's used this COVID-19 situation to sideline us. We started focusing on how do we get back to church? How do we do this? Um, but we've, we've forgotten about some key activities. And one is the importance of two or three gathering and praying. There is power in prayer. This is where we come into agreement with heaven and we take our position as salt and light in the earth. So we're gonna step to the charge. I just finished talking to another pastor who's willing to do the same thing. I'm gonna reach out to other pastors and I know it's last minute, but listen, prayer's not cute, it's not fancy, it's not something that you just put out with. This is not a show. This is not something we're looking to do just to say, hey, look at us, we're being spiritual. No, we're taking our position. Our city, this region, 
our nation and this world needs the kingdom of heaven right now like never before and we have to take our position so listen if you got that email i pray that you have already responded if you have not i need you to respond now we're going to have some prayer points we're going to be on point on top we're not going to get sidetracked this is intense de intentional deliberate prayer concerning what's happening in our nation and we're going to stand against and go into warfare against the kingdom of darkness who's really trying to pull off some very deceptive demonic activity right now in this world and um, i want to respond to the unction god has been showing people have been having different dreams and listen we hear and see in part the truth is we don't know what god is doing in this hour but we do know that he is god he's sovereign and he's doing something and we also know that the kingdom of darkness who operates through the ignorance of men is trying to be very deceptive right now and to bring about demonic activity that we, the light, need to disperse, all right? So I'm calling, we're starting Monday, we will have times, we're still putting together this as you guys sign up and say that you're willing, but I need you for at least one hour for seven days straight, right? That means, uh, that means if we get 10 per day, you'll have, only have one day out of the week. We're asking you to come and to pray, I mean to go into warfare. We'll have those prayer points and those topics, but we wanna bombard heaven for seven days straight. I'm trying to get as many people to come on board. Um, and then if you're out there and you don't attend our ministry, you wanna participate. Listen, for one hour, seven days, we're gonna tackle, uh, we're gonna bombard heaven and, and tackle what's in front of us as the church. And we'll make sure we put those prayer points on our website and on our social media site so that you can participate as well, all right? That is my call to you. All right, that is my call to you in this hour. I think we have to step up. We have to do this. All right, so I love you guys, and we will talk with you soon. Be looking out for this. And we listen, we're going to dominate our purpose by dominating our day. Amen. God bless you. I love you, and we'll talk to you soon.